are having a pretty good time. I hope you guys had a great weekend, a um, great week. I am supposed to tell you you're being recorded. So don't say anything that would ever uh, potentially influence towards the negative, your future uh, political potential. Do it. <laughs> but uh, I, today what I wanted to do is cover just a couple more things and then spend the last little bit answering uh, questions or potential questions that uh, we kind of invent that other people might have um, and, and talk about just how to get uh, the most points at this at this this point. You'll notice that I have been grading and I don't know some people's grades are going to be going up, some are going down. Try not to freak out too much until I'm all done. And then when I'm all done, you can freak out all you want. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we're going we're to talk about a couple things. And I, it's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. I was mentioning to Joey earlier that it's re there, I read that over 20 billion people have been born since 1900. And uh, it's really difficult to compress that much creative energy into a single semester. So rather than try, I, I didn't just talked about the highlights. <laughs> but that's, that's an awful lot of stuff to cram in. And so when we talk about art movements, when we talk about in, um, art styles, I hope everybody gets that these are really shallow generalizations for the most part. We're just picking up on the most identifiable features from a, uh, just a real cursory reading and then kind of exploring that a little bit. Well, this, as we get closer to the 20th century, uh, or the 21st century, what I see, and I, I'd like you guys' input on this too, because I, I think it, kind of, it is valid. I think it's a valid observation. What I see is a shift throughout the 20th century as people are trying to ex exploring the ideas of what art can be, as well as their uh, artist's relationship to um, potential viewers. And I, I see that explored extensively by a lot of different movements. One thing that I do think is really interesting though, is as we grow into this world spanning economy, where as we get closer and closer to uh, today, more and more things can be had by more and more people across the planet. You know, they, the costs of production are so cheap the material usage is so wildly improbable from the imaginations of people even you know 50 years earlier there is so much new stuff and then artists finally start taking advantage of it and i, I think you see that right in the mid of this middle of the 60s you know with the space race and everything going on um, because up until about 1965 1963 people almost always still used the same media that had been invented uh, during the Renaissance. I mean, you know, Renaissance brought oil paint and um, that, was the, the, that was the biggest shift in medium or, or the biggest addition of medium of the previous 1500 years. You know, you, you get egg tempera before that, which was a really big thing when uh, people were painting ossuary boxes and uh, tomb lids in Egypt, <laughs> you know, and then the, the next shift is oil paint. And I, I just, that boggles my mind that it took 1500 years for that to happen. Then it took 500 years for acrylic to be invented. And then within a decade, there are literally limitless possibilities for artists to work with. That, that could, you know, you, you get this, um, Oh, who was it that, who wrote about the tipping point? Uh, famous Gladwell. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell. And then you all get that coupled with the idea of critical mass, 
which is a uh, you know, big thing from the atomic era coming together and you get this explosion of possibilities. I mean, it really is astounding to me. We can see human made tools in China that go back 2 million years. And there's a possibility of architecture in South Africa that's 2 million years old. So intelligent beings, have been, you know, similar to us have been on this planet for a really long time. And I, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm all wise and all knowing that, you know, they couldn't have had flying machines during Atlantean times or whatever. But from the things that we have evidence of, the last 50 years, the last 70 years has seen an explosion of technology and materials that is more expansive and more rapid than the rest of Earth's history all put together. I, that just blows my mind. And I, I can't remember, I can't remember who it was. It was either Prince or the guy that played Johnny Depp's dad in the Pirates movies. What's his name? The guitarist? I don't know. You know who I'm talking about, though. I don't know. The, the head guitarist for Rolling Stones. Oh, Keith Richards. Or, or, yeah, yeah, Keith Richards. It was either Keith Richards or Prince who said, that with an ex um, a dramatic decrease in production costs, you get a dramatic increase in, or you get a dramatic decrease in production value, you know, almost always. But within that, you also get these sparks of light that would never have happened otherwise. And I think, you know, so, you know, a lot of garbage is made, a huge amount of garbage is made but we also get some really freakishly cool stuff coming along. And two of the things that I, I wanna talk about that one, the materials have always been around, but nobody started, started doing it really on any sort of a significant scale till the end of the 20th century. And the other one is just a, a roughly described group of art media that only could have, um, could have happened at the end of the 20th century. And that's uh, large scale land art or environmental art and uh, new media. And you know, new media is kind of a self-reflective name <laughs> because it's only about new media. And we're not, and we are talking about stuff that there is a lot of contemporary work as well, but I'm focusing in on stuff from the mid sixties um, up to the year 2000, basically, which, and then you can see this carrying forward um, today quite a bit. And some of the things, some of the artists do stuff that is still amazing, you know, 40 years later. And some of the artists, I, I hope you don't think it's too passe, but it's almost like they built monuments that now we're used to. And people do not realize how dramatic of a shift their thinking represented. So let's, I'm going to do a screen share, maybe if I can get it to work, there. Do you guys recognize this? Yeah, Great Salt Lake. Yeah, it's when it was still a lake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Robert Smith and you know, this, this was absolutely phenomenal. I was, I was watching a, a French video about it that I was going to share with you. And I thought, nah, we'll stick to English ones. But um, what is so amazing to me about this piece is he was commissioned to do something really big. And he wanted it to be incredibly site specific. And he also wanted it to be um, an active piece, you know, one that wasn't maintained as a static monument. And so every year there are groups of people that want to petition uh, Utah State for funds to restore it. But Robert Smithson, he said, you know, what, one of the things that is so phenomenal about the beauty of Utah is that it is an ever-changing morphing landscape and things dissolve into it and grow out of it all the time. And so he did not want anybody to mess with the spiral jetty. You know, ideally, for him, he said that 
it should melt into the landscape over time. Which I, I think it is really cool. So this idea of a very site-specific work outside of monuments carved uh, into the mountains, you know, like a uh, crazy horse or some of the temples in India, for example, or that, that great, um, the treasury in Petra that all the very cool movies throughout the years have filmed at from the last crusade to uh, seven voyages of Sinbad, you know, it's, there are very few site specific works on the magnitude of Robert Smith's and Spiral Jetty. And then we, we go, you know, and um, I, so I wanted to watch a couple of things about, about this and, and, and see that. But then I also wanted to introduce you guys to new media, a la <laughs> the 1970s. Have you guys ever seen this? It's called uh, the Bell, the Pre-Bell Man. And it is uh, designed by Jan, uh, Nam Jun Pike. He's a Korean artist who's, I think is, he was easily 30 years ahead of his time. But uh, this, this gentleman is supposed to be, you know, an equestrian monument, but made with, you know, 1960s and 1970s era technology. <laughs> I think it's awesome. It reminds me, this was, this was made quite a while ago in 1988 but it reminds me very much of that Disney movie, uh, Robots. I think it's kind of a, a fun retro kind of thing. So I, I think what I wanna do is, I would like you guys to watch all these videos. Again, we don't have a weekly reflection due for this week, but I would like you to go through and watch these videos because I think you'll get a kick out of them. I think what I wanna do is watch two of these and uh, talk about it a bit and then watch maybe one of these and then talk about it and then we'll go on and look at some other artists too. So the first one I want to watch is this Robert Smithson one and this is uh, from Smart History. I love these guys. They do an awful lot with, um, they, they use those tools of artistic critique that we've been talking about and take and just examine uh, specific elements of art or specific uh, examples of art using those elements of critique. And I, I think they're fascinating. And I like the music. In 1970, Robert Smithson hired several people to help him create Spiral Jetty. We're standing right in the middle at the edge of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. But we're not seeing this the way that it existed when Smithson first created it, where it was an intersection between the land and the very odd water of the Great Salt Lake. This is a terminal basin, a huge lake that had been largely fresh water, but there is no outlet. So the water, once it flows here from rivers and streams, collects and then simply evaporates, which means that the water is dense with minerals. And especially with salt, very much like the Dead Sea in the Middle East. And this is one of a handful of these terminal basins that exist in the world. Almost nothing can live here. There are a few fish that live at the outlet of some of the freshwater rivers. And, and there are brine shrimp and algae. In fact, there's a particular kind of algae that makes the water turn pinkish red. And that was true when Smithson created Spiral Jetty. But today, as we look out at the lake, it's blue. With help from the Dawn Gallery, which represented him, Smithson was able to bring a front loader and dump trucks, a tractor to help move these basalt stones and sand and some soil into place. By creating a spiral, Smithson created lots of opportunities where the land and the water could meet one another. But right now, because the American West is in the midst of a drought, the water has receded and is at a great distance from this earthwork. So instead of the water filling the spaces in between the spiral, we have sand. So this was very much meant to be a work of art that changed based on natural principles. Smithson was interested in the idea of entropy, the idea of the way things break down, and his intervention in this natural landscape. It's an expression of the way in which artists have thought about the landscape for many years. 
We could go back to artists like Caspar David Friedrich, who thought about the overwhelming size and power of nature and the smallness of man. And that's certainly one of the themes here for me as we stand here. But we could also think about the importance of the vastness of the American landscape in 19th century American painting or even its importance to the abstract expressionists in the 1950s. We can go even further back and look at the artwork of indigenous peoples in the Americas long before the Europeans arrived. The geoglyphs that are known as the Nazca lines in Peru, in South America, or the earthworks that come out of the Fort Ancient culture in North America. And in fact, the very shape of spiral jetty is a form that has shown up in petroglyphs throughout the American West. And it's a form that appears in nature quite frequently. One of the anecdotes that Smithson apparently was aware of was the centuries-old idea that the Great Salt Lake contained a whirlpool that somehow connected it to the Pacific Ocean. So the idea of a spiral or whirlpool is active even in these stories that predate Smithson. But this is also a sculpture that is rooted in the 20th century in an industrial culture. 1970 was the year of the first Earth Day, and that signaled an important early moment in the environmental movement. The idea of the ruination that man was visiting on nature is clearly informing work like this. And Earth Day being this time when we reflect on environmental issues, but the relationship between the growing industrial nature of the United States and the amazingly beautiful, vast virgin landscape that was here when Europeans arrived is a theme throughout 19th century American painting. And as we stand here, we see mountains. We see this basalt that's formed from a volcano. So we have a very powerful sense of the passage of time that I think was very interesting to Smithson. By putting art outside in the world, it becomes part of the process of nature. It can't be conserved. In 1970, this was still a radical idea, the idea of taking art off the wall bringing it outside, outside of the confines of a home or a museum. And thereby outside of the commercial of a work that could be bought and sold. Smithson was interested in creating a porous relationship between that more controlled gallery experience and the experience of art in the world. So can a work like this also exist in Manhattan? Can it also exist in a gallery? Well, we did drive two hours from Salt Lake City. So one does have to make an intentional pilgrimage to see this. We're really in the middle of a vast, empty space in the American West. And yet this artwork was not conceived of as existing only here. There's a video, there are aerial photographs. And so like many works of art in the 1960s and 70s that were ephemeral, they exist through their documentation, although this still exists here also. And I have to say, I wouldn't feel as if I had experienced this work of art fully had I not come out here. Standing here looking at Spiral Jetty and being really aware of how different it is than when Smithson created it in 1970 really makes me think about museums as places where we entrust works of art. We lock them away from time. We conserve them and create special conditions to stop time from hurting them. But here, Smithson created something that time is supposed to change. Museums, in a sense, try to do the impossible, which raises a really interesting question. What do we do with the significant work of art that was intended to change over time? This work of art and the land that it sits on came under the control of the DIA Art Foundation. What does an institution like DIA do with something like this? Does it try to protect it? Does it allow natural and industrial forces to play with the landscape around it? And so what DIA did is, in concert with the Getty Conservation Institute, is to make the decision to regularly document this object. You mentioned this idea of entropy, which was so important to Smithson, this idea that the tendency of all things, according to the laws of physics, is to move from order to disorder, to chaos. And I think we have that sense of things coming apart here. So Smithson is imposing geometric order into this natural landscape, into this vast space that is in the process over millions of years of disassembling. But here, more specifically, we can see the way his intervention is slowly coming apart. And I think that sense that over millions of years this will come apart makes us aware of the brevity of our own lifespans in the grandeur of time. What did you guys think of that? I like the fact that they decided just to let it be and document it. 
that's pretty cool yeah. to let art be Just art. Leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, Robert um, Smithson was killed in the plane crash surveying his next right. land art piece, right? Right. That's right. And so, like that, I don't know. That sort of uh, to me, I have a hard time separating that from um, um, watching the entropy of his work too. It just makes it feel so final. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, and I love that he is like the the master of entropy sculpture, <laughs> in, of natural en entropy sculpture. And I I love the fact that that became a medium that artists could suddenly that artists had permission to work with the idea of entropy by itself. And that get, gives rise to a whole host of, of other possibilities that I think are just amazing. There's a Mexican artist, Francis Alice, that I really love because he is, he's a social artist. He, he's been creating mostly in the last 15, 20 years, uh, but he loves the idea of com combining human activity with large scale environmental work. And my favorite piece that he did was in Mexico and it was called Faith Move, Moves Mountains, where he asked for hundreds of volunteers to arrive at a certain mountain. And it was basically this natural sand dune. And he got permission beforehand, of course, so nobody got arrested. Everybody brought shovels and these hundreds of volunteers spent all day shoveling the sand dune uh, over on top of itself. And in the course of one day, they actually moved a mount an entire mountain two feet. And I just that that is really astonishing to me because you think about it on the surface. Well, that's not really art, but everybody there that participated coming from an environment, you know, this is during a time where there's an economic downturn and a lot of people are feeling hopeless. They just did something that changed the face of the world. And I, I, I think that's incredible. <laughs> And so when I, when I look at, at land art like this, it really is astonishing to me, that kind of thinking. Because now we think, oh, yes, we have permission to do that. But at the time that he made Spiral Jetty, no one really knew what was going to happen. I, I think it's pretty amazing. There's another short video, too, that I want to share before we go on. And this is with, a, with another sculptor who, whose work I really, I really like. Do you like the word land art? No. Why? It, it's American. It's a term that invented by some critics to describe particularly American land art, which is obviously my same generation, but um, with a different philosophy completely. U using machines, buying land is about the ownership of the land. Um, it's about uh, making monuments. I'm not interested in making monuments at all. Yeah. So, I'll, can but you? I, but I think the ideas in my work are very important because it's about space and distance. So I can make a work of art which is a thousand miles long just by walking. And is there words that you could use for what you do? I, I just call myself an artist, and I, I, my work takes many forms, from a footstep to a fingerprint, putting stones on the mountain top, yeah, it takes many, many forms, photographs, text works, exhibitions, a text too. text? Text works. I didn't know about text. That was uh, Richard Long. And Richard Long is an artist. He's also technically a land artist, even though he doesn't like that term. <laughs> but the, the point there is um, we saw Robert Smithson's work, which was very much a monument in land, the landscape. And then Richard Long, he uses his environmental work to kind of document the possibilities of human activity. And I think that's really fascinating. For him, the, uh, it's, it's more like a, a combinate, combining performance art with you know, changing the landscape. So um, with, with the difference being that there's gonna be evidence of his performance art 
for potentially a very long time. You know, when he makes a, takes a pilgrimage to the mountaintop, makes a cairn of stones and then walks away, that cairn is gonna be there for a significant length of time. And I, I just wanted to show those two different kinds of perspectives um, on land art or environmental art. And I, I think it's kind of expressive of the idea that there is a huge range of possible expression. Uh, there is another person um, who, I can't remember his name, Kanye West thinks he's really awesome, but uh, he did um, Sun Crater and he's still working on that where he has a, a volcanic mountain that he's hollowing out the inside. So you can go into this open air or this open ceiling room and just enjoy the, the, the sky. And he has different uh, siding tunnels that he's carved into this mountain and everything. So Richard or um, Robert Smithson did something that felt very natural um, Richard Long does stuff that is evidence of his, you know, human activity. And then this other person, I'm sorry, oh, I'm, I'm going to, this bothers me now. I didn't include him because uh, Sun Crater is a, a little bit more recent. And let's see, Sun Crater. James Terrell, uh, Road and Crater is what it is. Yeah, J James Terrell is, is an artist who's fascinated with light. And he did, did start back in the 20th century, but he's uh, a lot of his surviving, a lot of his stuff is very contemporary. But the Sun Crater is just a, a completely different take on this idea of landscape art. And we'll, we'll look at a couple different ones. But then we also get the idea of, I, I think that that environmental art is something that there needed to be some sort of a cognitive shift for artists to generate the possibility. And then I think a very physical shift is the shift in technology in media. And that leads us to new media art. So I wanna share a couple of things about that too. Okay, and this is only about two minutes long. This is gonna cover some more contemporary stuff too, but I think you'll get a pretty good idea of 20th century aspect of new media art. Don't be scared, it's just shark. Hello, and welcome to our podcast on the history of new media art. Today, we'll be exploring the origins and evolution of this fascinating art form. So let's dive in. New media art has its roots in the 1960s when artists began to experiment with emerging technologies such as video and computer graphics. One of the pioneers of video art was Nam Joon Paik, who created works that used video as a medium for artistic expression. Paik's work challenged traditional art forms and paved the way for future generations of new media artists. In the 1970s, video art gained popularity, and artists began to use it as a medium for creating and sharing their work. This led to the development of a new genre of art that was focused on the exploration of time-based media. One of the most well-known examples of this type of art is Bill Viola's The Crossing, a video installation that explores the theme of life and death. With the advent of personal computers in the 1980s, artists gained access to new tools for creating and manipulating digital images. This led to the development of computer graphics a new form of art that used computers to generate images and animations. One of the most famous computer graphics artists is John Whitney, who created works that explored the relationship between music and abstract visual forms. In the 1990s, the internet became more widely available, and artists began to explore new ways to use it for artistic expression. This led to the emergence of net art, a new form of art that was distributed over the internet. One of the most well-known examples of net art is Olia Lialina's My Boyfriend Came Back from the War, an interactive narrative that explores the themes of war, love, and memory. Today, new media art continues to evolve and push the boundaries of what we think of as art. 
I think that's probably pretty good right there. One thing I, I like about that, the presentation too, is that it is very indicative of new media art too, having just the, that voiceover with the responsive audio bar. <laughs> but uh, th this is kind of an interesting thing because the only other technology that is specific, that was a, a specific increase in the potential uh, possibilities of media use was photography. You know, and that was invented 150 years before this other technology. And then all, we get a huge burst of technology from that time forward now. And I, I think I think that, that is just astounding. And, you know, out of net art, we get, uh, today we have um, NFTs. You know, out of uh, computer graphics, today we have interactive graphics and movies. I, I think one of the, the first uh, movies that did that was I think about 2012, it was about, uh, it was called Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, where uh, people, actors are basically in a green screen environment and it's the first movie that most of the set design was uh, animated, you know, computer generated animations. And then, and then of course we get uh, Batman, the, the, you know, Edward as Batman, um, which I, I think is perfect blending. Who else would make a good Batman than a vampire, right? But uh, that I think was amazing. Did you know that they had built, they had designed and built an interactive uh, screen all around the sets so that you're not seeing into the distance. You're seeing about 30 feet away at the most, but it is locked into the camera so well that the animation moves with the, the focal point uh, of the camera and the audience. So you have no idea that, you know, when they're supposed to be outside, they're actually in a room that's, you know, the size of a warehouse. So I, that kind of stuff is just astounding to me. But uh, Namjoon Pike is one of my heroes from that, that movement because his stuff, like Robert Smithson, is way ahead of people's thinking and still is incredibly impactful. So we're going to dive in a little bit with um, some of these land artists. And what, one important point that I, I think they brought out was that uh, environmental art, land art, that kind of stuff has been around for a while. Uh, you know, you look at the, the mounds, the Cahokia mounds, the, the Mississippian culture that was in North America, and as well as uh, you look at the pyramids made in China out of tamped earth and, and Japan out of tamped earth. You know, th these are kinds of things where it's architecture that's constructed specifically with the materials at hand in the environment already. And I, I think that that's pretty remarkable. But nobody's thought about doing anything like it for, you know, over a thousand years. And then you get all these 70s era artists that are suddenly thinking, well, what else can we do? <laughs> It's probably a little bit more thought than that that went into it. But I, I think this uh, video is, is a good one to watch. It is done, it was done on April 22nd, I think a year or two ago. So specifically about Earth Day and the environment. And if you remember the Robert Smithson in 1970, that was the first Earth Day, which is April 22nd. And that's what really, um, he felt tied uh, his work in to the social consciousness is because it was Earth Day. Now, so the three artists I wanna look at a little bit is Nancy Holt who did Sun Tunnels in Utah and um, Michael Heiser or Heiser and then Crystal and Jean-Claude who are um, some of my favorites. I, I love, absolutely love Crystal and Jean-Claude which is interesting because a few years ago when I first came across them I first came across them about 30 years ago, and I thought they were just wastes of skin, uh, just complete waste of time. And then I started learning about them and I found out how amazing they are. So we're probably not gonna watch this whole thing, just a little bit of it, it is nine minutes long. I would like you guys to watch it though.
When we talk about earth art or land art, there's likely a few things that come to mind. You've likely heard of Robert Smithson's spiral jetty at the Great Salt Lake in Utah, or seen one of Andy Goldsworthy's site-specific sculptures like this one at Storm King Art Center, or maybe visiting New Mexico to view Walter De Maria's lightning field has been on your bucket list. But there's one artist whose dedication, whose obsession may make these other projects feel like, well, child's play. Art lovers, hello, and welcome to the channel. I've tried to create a space here where we can talk about modern and contemporary art and design in a hopefully non-pretentious way. And today I would like to talk about Michael Heiser. Now, if the name Michael Heiser doesn't immediately roll off your tongue, you may be familiar with what was, until recently, his most famous and most published work, Double Negative. Heiser created this work not by shaping steel like Richard Serra, or carving marble like Barbara Hepworth. He created the sculpture through subtraction. More specifically, he subtracted more than 240,000 tons of earth and stone from the Mormon Mesa in southeastern Nevada. By doing this, he created two enormous trenches, each of which is 1,500 feet long, 50 feet deep, and 30 feet wide. Both incisions mirror each other, lining up perfectly from opposite sides of the canyon. Heiser had a romantic view of this artwork, designed as a space where the viewer can contemplate their relationship with the land, but also force the audience to reconsider their notions of what art is or even could be. Heiser would say, there are works of art that can be considered works of art, but don't have to be in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. Heiser was 26 years old when he finished this artwork, but how and why did he come to make Double Negative? And certainly after this very ambitious undertaking, why did he then decide to make something arguably a thousand times more ambitious? Well, we're about to get into all that. When Heiser was 12 years old, he took a year off of school to join his archeologist father on a dig in Mexico. Here he would make site drawings for his father and he would expand on this exercise throughout his career. In the mid 1960s, he would attend the San Francisco Art Institute, but would drop out to move to New York. He supported himself by painting apartments and one such apartment belonged to Walter De Maria. Yes, that Walter De Maria I mentioned in the intro. Michael and Walter would become close friends. And they began to collaborate on ideas that would become the foundation of what we now know as earth art or land art. Heiser's art at this time often focused on paintings in which he would carve geometric shapes out of his canvases. But he wanted to create work that was much larger, that wasn't constrained by the dimensions of the canvas, the gallery, or even the city. He eventually found that New York was not conducive for the type of art he wanted to create and, supported by the art dealer and philanthropist, Virginia Dewan, moved back west to Nevada. Heiser's first experiment with earth art came in 1967 with a piece called North, East, South, West. The work was to consist of four excavations in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Each excavation would represent one of the four directions on the compass, but only two of this now long gone sculpture were ever created. Decades later, the Dia Art Foundation commissioned Heiser to recreate this piece indoors. And these are the images you're about to see. Constructed for the first time in its entirety with the dimensions and material that Heiser had originally specified. This work is a sequence of geometric pits, two stacked cubic forms for North, a cone for South, a triangle for West, in an inverted truncated cone for east. Together they measure more than 125 feet in length and sink from the floor of the gallery to a depth of 20 feet. Heiser has made a sculpture not by creating something in space, but by removing the space altogether. All of a sudden, by removing the space, Heiser creates a sense of potential physical danger that dramatically changes the viewing experience. Pro tip, I've visited the sculpture many times, but only learned this while researching for this video. You can schedule a private, more intimate tour of North, East, South, West each day before Dia Beacon opens to the public. During regular hours, there is a glass barrier that partially prevents you from peering into the depth of the sculpture and presumably saves you from tumbling to the bottom. But this tour allows you to experience the piece as Heiser intended. And so it looks like I'll be making another pilgrimage to my favorite museum again very soon. 
So after creating this negative space in the ground, what's the next logical step? Obviously, create a negative space by going through the ground. And that's just what Double Negative did, completed just a few years after North, East, South, West. But Heiser was only getting started. In the early 1970s, he started his magnum opus, a piece simply called City. This would be a project unlike any the world had ever seen in scale, concept, and form. A project that, more than 50 years later, just started accepting visitors last year. So what is City? First, at more than a mile and a half long, it's one of the largest works of art in the world. Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic for the New York Times wrote, this was a largely DIY project by a self-taught artist at the scale of new town planning. It was a Sisyphean shore. It is intended to resemble a large urban complex, but unlike any you've seen before. It's a network of huge geometric forms, mounds, pits, and walls. It's built from the natural soil found in the area, as well as rocks, clay, concrete, and granite. Unlike some of his previous work we have discussed, this is not art created from negative space. City is built upon the earth. It was inspired by Native American mound building in the ancient cities of Central and South America, as well as the stepped pyramids in Egypt. Harriet Lloyd Smith would write in Wallpaper Magazine that the final result resembles a Mayan meets modernist ruin. It's divided into a series of complexes that feature undulating mounds and volumes that reach towards the sky as if they pierce through the Earth's crust. Lloyd Smith goes on to say that city defies categorization. It's not just earth art, it's endurance art for both the artist and the visitor, it's sculpture and assemblage, it's architecture and performance. Heiser has literally redefined what sculpture can be. But if you wanna see it in person, you're gonna need a ticket and a reservation because only six people are allowed in per day. As an art dealer, I'm always fascinated by the market for a particular artist or a particular work. And so how do we quantify Heiser's artwork? He was literally making art out of voids and negative space. I think that's that's a really good question. You know, the the kinds of things that he was doing, I that, that's what that's what I love. He doesn't he doesn't fit comfortably into a standardized mo uh, mold for anybody. First off, this thing is gigantic, mile and a half long. Uh, you know, this this huge modernist cityscape. But it is exponentially different than what anybody's thought about doing beforehand. I mean, th there are complexes that are bigger around the world, very, you know, very definitely. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that the Giza Plateau, the entire area, all the pyramids are, were um, designed in a specific format thousands of years ago. I, I say that because uh, at least, well, about a half a dozen so far now, pyramids uh, have been found buried underneath the sand when people started applying um, archaeoastronomy to where potential pyramids could be. And they started finding these structures under the sand. So it looked like it was planned out way in advance. Uh, and these are not full pyramids by any means, but they are foundations for future pyramids cut into the bedrock. Did you guys know that? Uh, it's just incredibly. So that, that's one example. And then you get um, in uh, Angkor Wat in Thailand. Uh, and that the whole, there's a huge, there, it's within a complex of temples that was designed and planned out about 700 years ago. And then the, the temples were just gradually built so that they're, it's, in, it's designed to be a city of temples, but they're not all within sight of each other. It's just it's gigantic. Stuff like that just boggles my mind. But these are, these are things that are relatively recent um, revelations. So, you know, Heiser did not know about that when he was building this thing. I, I, I think it's phenomenal. I don't know if it's anybody else's cup of tea. But I do see there's there's a lot. Of, it's like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture that we talked about was specific to the Americas because he drew not just from uh, you know Bauhaus sensibility, but he drew from the native landscape elements of where he was building homes 
and were and quite uh, specifically from uh, graphic elements of the prairie, uh, the the the, the um, uh, wisteria and the ryegrass, as well as the Tlaloc Mayan uh, architecture. You know, bringing it all together. And Heiser shows demonstrates that he's doing that as well. And I, I just think it's kind of exciting. So, little fanboy uh, celebration on my part. And then um, another one I want to look at, another person I want to look at is Nancy Holt, who, have you guys been to the sun tunnels in Utah? I'm sorry. No. I see. No. no, and I was going to say, and double negative is really close to us. I haven't been to that yet either. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's something I, I had no idea was there until I started putting together this lesson. I mean, that, that's exciting. I want to go there. I don't know if I know a large enough group of mentally stable individuals who would also be willing to go, but I, I think that'd be that'd be a really fun trip. Yeah, I, I have to quantify that. <laughs> mentally stable. <laughs> okay, so I want to. Yeah, Nancy Holt, I think, is pretty remarkable. Like inert slabs of concrete kind of stuff you see by the side of a motorway. But actually, they really fit the colors, the desert, this clay soil stuff. And when something falls on it, some color, look at that. You can see the reds inside that tunnel. And then all around us, there are these beautiful fields of ochre and yellow and brown and khaki hundreds of different colors. It's just gorgeous. And the other thing, apart from me prattling on, there's no sound. Listen to that. The sound of the sun tunnels. Is that it isn't just about the bits in the middle, the stuff that Nancy Holt made and put down here in the desert. What land art does is it brings everything else into play. Well, you stand here, the mountains over there, this big horizon around here, the sun, all of it seems to take on an extra significance. So the actual piece, these four concrete tunnels lying in the middle of the desert, that's just like the final piece of a jigsaw. You put that in, and all of it's complete. Nancy Holt was Robert Smithson's wife. She made this in 1973. She came down one day into the desert, was wandering about here, and was overwhelmed, she said, by the feeling of the sun. She said, if you come from a city, you don't really see the sun, but when you come out into the desert, the sun becomes everything. So she came up with this piece, which for her was a way of framing, enfranchising the sun in the middle of the desert. And what she did, she took these four concrete tunnels. They're huge and nine foot tall and arranged them in the desert along the two lines, the winter solstice and the summer solstice. So this set of tunnels here is aligned with the summer solstice. That set of tunnels there is aligned with the winter solstice. We're not here on the perfect day. If we were here on the summer solstice, you would see the sun coming up right in the middle of the second tunnel. Which I'm sure it's really dramatic. So that's this, that's just here, Perseus. Named, of course, after a great Greek hero who slayed Medusa, the one with all the snake heads. And he rescued Andromeda from the dragon. So the way this works is that when the sun comes over the tunnels, each of these beams 
throws circle of light onto the ground. So what you'll be doing when the sun is right up there in the sky is literally walking over the stars. They'll be on the ground and you'll be walking over them. Delightful idea. And Nancy Holt, when she was planning this, she got a team of astronomers at work here. And all this is actually absolutely to the centimetre. It's all perfectly aligned. One of the things I really like about land art is that it's always about these big subjects, the cosmos, the summer solstice, the sun, the stars, big ideas. So much more than art is about cheap ideas. You know, it's about movies, it's about celebrity, it's about what's on TV, it's about what it's like to go shopping. Interesting, relevant ideas, but cheap ideas, small ideas. Land art, it's impossible to make land art about celebrities and TV and going shopping. If you're making land art, you have to make art about this, about the big ideas. So of course it's no coincidence that most of the really good land artists are Americans. <laughs> to make land art, you need all this. I, re I really like I really like that. I, I like seeing that. And one of the things I really appreciate what him about his prattling on, as he said, is we, we talked specifically about um, the cognitive shift of the artist entering into the modern age that really gained momentum and articulation with the Cubist, which is engaging potential audience and requiring them to do thinking, <laughs> requiring them to participate in generating meaning for the art. And I, I, I really like that because with land art, it's very difficult to view land art you know, with, with a, a three by five card or a museum placard that gives you the context. You have to, for the most part, you're required to also generate context. You have to tease it out. You have to unfold it from the environment. And uh, the other perspective that I really liked is that Nancy Holt, he was talking about her really not putting something in the middle of the desert, but providing something of a, a finishing touch for the, the art that was already there. And I, I really, I really love that perspective too. So land art to be effective seems that it needs to be really big and it needs to fit wherever it goes. And I, I, I think that that's fantastic. What, what did you guys get about it? Just thinking about the, the juxtaposition between um, the different artists that were shown. Um, it seems that one is, you know, conquering the earth, leaving your imprint on the earth um carving the earth out um and i i just really love um nancy's touch is just really delicate and it's just sort of noticing it's not trying to yeah. like change anything it's trying to help you see what's already there yeah i love that and she was married to robert smithson and he was very much like heiser you know michael heiser and it's interesting to me that it, her work is not in any way a critique of the other people. It's just a different perspective. And I, and I love that. I, I think they fit really well together. Because if you did sun tunnels next to Heiser City, it would not fit, feel out of place. I, I think it would be just fine. I'm glad they're not next to each other. You know, ex except for the fact that there's not really any sort of public toilets out there. That kind of sucks. But everything else I think is, is really amazing. And of course, that's where my mind is always going. Anytime there's any car ride that's more longer than 22 and a half minutes, that's what I've got to be mindful of. <laughs> Sigh. But then, and then um, I wanted to share, and I'm glad you said that, Joey, because I am trying to show different perspectives of, of what people are doing. And I really love 
Jean-Claude and Christo because they take a completely different perspective on land art. And I, I, I love their perspective as well. So we'll watch uh, just a short video about them too. This is 48 Howard Street in New York, Soho. And behind this unassuming door, the hidden universe of Christo and Jean-Claude. Not only did they live here, this is also the very center of their creativity. And in just a moment, Lorenzo Giovanelli is gonna walk us through the unique world they created here. Hi, hi, good morning. Hi, hi Lorenzo. Good morning. How are you? Great Thank career. you. This chat, it's part of the Soho charm. <laughs> now you are in Christian Jean Claude home. There's a kind of magical energy fizzing in the air here at 48 Howard Street. This was the building where Christo and Jean-Claude initially came in 1964. It was the place to be in New York for most of the artistic crowd and intellectuals and writers. And when Christo and Jean-Claude moved in, they rolled their, their sleeves mm -hmm. and the two of them improvised themselves. Carpenters, painters, the all the work design. was done by Christo and Jean-Claude and a bunch of friends. Christo designed the space, mm -hmm. he designed first the apartment, and then he started to work on this floor. Everything started from here. It's a space where he would spend hours, have ideas, physically create things. Every single object talks about him. It's like being in a portrait of Christo here. The collection that gradually fills the walls of the apartment he shared with Jean-Claude below us includes all sorts of different artists. How should we think about that collection and the way that it came together? We like to put in our homes our family photos. For instance, these artworks were really like people. So they moments are, in their in, are moments in their, life. in their lives. They are memories of people. Mm. They're memories of places they've been. They're memories of experiences they had. Each of these artworks tell a story. Uh, artworks were everywhere. They were not seen as precious artifacts. They were just seen as something that was part of the apartment. So it was there and some of them were not even framed. Some others were just concealed in some hidden corners and you would discover them only because by chance you look there. And that was very magical because it was like listening to a conversation yes. between all these are different artists and different artworks. And somehow each time you look at them, they always had something new to say. Patricia and Klaas Oldenburg, whom they already knew from Europe, they also moved to New York. Klaas gave him the plaster mm. of sculptures, steak and egg and ice cream and bacon, that, and actually on one of the plates, he even inscribed them to Christo. Yeah, and they've always been part of the collection. Fontana was very fond of Jean-Claude. He loved her, and Fontana asked Jean-Claude to choose an artwork. She picked a beautiful Atheza, so one of Fontana's cats, and made of this natural canvas. And it's been hanging on the kitchen wall and it stayed there. Warhol looks different if you hang next to Duchamp and Duchamp next to, to, to Warhol. I know. But this work in particular, very important Jackie as widow painting, yeah. was a significant one within the collection. One of the few artworks that Christian Jean Claude bought from a collector and friend of them, David Burden, who got the painting from Handy himself. That's why he's inscribed on the back to David. At some point, David wants to sell it, of course, and he gets that praised for a thousand dollars. Jean-Claude said, you know, David, if you're selling it, I want to buy it. And I offer you one dollar more to have the Andy Warhol for me. So they got Jackie and the Marine for one thousand and one dollar. Yves Klein was another artist where there's a very close personal connection between yes. the artists. In fact, even a collaboration between the, the two. Was. This, this video is talking quite a bit about his life and everything, or their lives. 
but I want to, you to see a couple of things that I think are pretty remarkable. Let's see, right here. I'm going to mute it just a bit here. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get one particular frame of the video and it's not being very particularly helpful. Oh, right here. Do you, do you see this, the, the Reichstag? What is fascinating to me as Jean-Claude and Christo uh, from the, the 50s started wrapping things. And it wasn't until the end of the 60s, early part of the 70s, that they took that out into the landscape and started wrapping monuments, doing things like floating barges filled with oil drums. I think some of the first ones that they did were filling alleyways with uh, empty containers and chairs, making them you know, ob obstructed passageways for people. But then I, it was in Navajo Bridge where they put wind socks you know, here in Utah. And, uh, wrapping islands. There's the, the Florida Keys, where uh, it was the, the piers that they did, where the orange plastic wrapping islands there. Uh, the Reichstag was a really big one. They, they've been playing that for a while. But the takeaway is, you look at this, this is one of the paintings he did, where he's trying to find out not where the practical folds are going to be, not where the practical places to put the ropes are going to be, but where it looks right. And so wrapping things was a lot more for them about um, the artistry, what it was gonna look like, rather than just haphazardly packaging. And I, I think a, a lot of people get that wrong. There's uh, more recent ones are, uh, he did, uh, they did a beach together, uh, and a couple other things like that, but, um, and then there's the the, um, the gates in Manhattan and uh, uh, several other things like that. They also did a series of structures where they took and um, wrapped trees and uh, earlier ones, you, you, they wrapped uh, people. And uh, what is fascinating to me about their land art is Nancy Holt, uh, she, she took the cement, to, um, you know, their sewer tunnels, essentially, put them in the center of the, the desert. Robert Smithson, uh, it was rocks that he moved. Uh, Heiser, it was, you know, carving things out and gravel and stuff. But with Jean-Claude and Christo, it was all about plastic and uh, cloth and different things like that. What's fascinating to me, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about my observation, and I want you guys to, to um, say something or uh, respond to it too. What's fascinating to me is that there is a very real thing that is specific to a lot of animals that do thinking, you know, that practice thinking. And I, I'm talking about octopuses, I'm talking about dogs and cats, um, uh, dolphins, whales, and specifically human beings, where if you put a barrier between us and something else, uh, if it's food worthy, animals are going to go for it. And if a person knows that there's something on the other side, we're going to go for it. Doesn't matter what it is. We don't have to smell it. We don't have to see it. If we know that something's on the other side of that shower curtain or that canvas or that plastic, we're going to look for it. And it's interesting to me that Jean-Claude and Christo engaged that very specifically with their land art, making people more aware of something that they had just dismissed because they saw it all the time. And, with the, the, and they got a lot of uh, criticism for it too. With the, the Florida Keys, um, they were, they were uh, being sued on behalf of the residents of Florida for disrupting the natural economy or ecology. And what is so funny is that for about eight years, the people in that area have been begging Jean-Claude and Krista to come because they wanted, first, they wanted people to be aware that this is a beautiful area for tourism. And second, they wanted to save the manatees because there's a lot of really stupid tourists that uh, have illegal propellers on their boats 
And there's a lot of manatees that are se severely injured because of stupid tourists. Those are the two big things. So Jean-Claude and Christo, they, they did not, everything that they did was uh, funded by volunteer donations, which I, I think is astounding. They got enough donations to hire the people in that Florida community for three years to manage the project and put it together. And it completely, by uh, wrapping something in plastic and made people around the world more interested in it, and it, they saved the life of hundreds of manatees and completely uh, transformed the economy of this dying community. We, and I, I think it's amazing. So it was land art where people cover something and it revitalizes human engagement with the thing that's been there forever. I, I just think that that's fantastic. Kind of, um, and, and rather ironic too, where engagement happens when something's hidden. So what do, what do you guys think about? Um, I was this? thinking about a lot of the stuff and how it like simplifies the form and, and makes, you know, things a little more know, approachable. You know, that simple shape when things are wrapped. I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, it, it does simplify the form quite a bit. And you, you don't see all the, the nuance of, of shape, for example. How about you, Jody? Yeah, so um, uh, photography, you like to say um, the camera is just a tool um, to help you learn how to see. Um, and that's the thing with photography is you can't make a photograph of something that you can't, that you don't see or don't notice. Um, and so I view that um, the work they're doing in a similar light, it's, it's, uh, but it's interactive, it's getting people to maybe notice something, teaching people how to see something. That's kind of how I read it. I like it. Yeah, definitely. And they, they make, without being assertive in their views, they make some really powerful statements too, like covering the Reichstag and the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, made some really powerful views and very specifically engaging people to um, take personal responsibility in their governments. And when they, when they covered the Reichstag, it increased uh, voter activity by like double of what, what was going on in Germany at the time, which is astounding to me uh, that, that one thing would have so much engagement. Yeah, we, I said I would go pretty fast. I'm going to do one more artist. We're going to talk about, and that's it. And then I'll um, address questions and stuff like that. But this is a new media art. And we're specifically talking about art that pretty much could not exist before the end of the 20th century. And uh, this article is by Masterclass. Masterclass has some amazing free stuff. You can also pay um, you know, to take the courses. But what is really cool is that they go on and talk quite a bit about what new media art is and what the origins are. And I, I think that that's pretty fantastic. The two artists that I think are, are really astounding, for the, well, there's three that I picked, is uh, one is Namjoon Pike. His uh, electronic superhighway is astounding. You know, he has everything out in neon tubing and uh, he has all these video monitors and everything like that. But this is done, do, do you guys want to guess when that was done? It was like 1980. I mean, I can see something like this being done today very easily, but he was easily 30 years ahead of his time doing this kind of stuff because nobody else even thought about this kind of thing until decades later. And then Bill Viola, one of the things that makes video art, video art rather than videography, is that it deals with these larger ideas that are not confined by traditional narrative. And uh, Bill Viola, his, um, I think it's called Passages, is really interesting because he's taking film, uh, getting permission, of course, from the families of babies taking their first breaths and then people dying a natural death, taking their last breath. 
and having them on two monitors right next to each other and sometimes opposite each other, you know, where you can only see one at a time, but you can hear both of them. And it's fascinating because you're confronted in a very con uh, real way with this idea of mortality. And I kind of, a little bit is, is interesting, more is better, but being confronted like that, where that's the only thing in your senses in the room uh, becomes really profound. But I, I, think it, I think it's astounding. And then um, Jenny Holzer, I, what brings her to this is, you know, typo typography has been around for, for a significant amount of time. But what she was doing is she was one of the first people to really take unconnected um, structured text and put them up in uh, different graphical ways so that you're confronted not with just with the idea of the words, but also the, the process of communicating with words. And I, I think it's really interesting. She did a lot of different kinds of things. This particular exhibit, Inflammatory Essays, is she would write confrontational essays and sometimes just observational essays about things that were very specific to the time period that this was, was done in, and then display them covering the walls of the room. So you'd come in, the first thing you'd see are these stripes, which reminds us quite a bit of the, the, the pop art earlier, and, you know, and op art. And then you realize that there's text is not being used just as a textual uh, element, like what Picasso did, but there's actually something to that. And then it would start engaging people and they would come in and see it. And what's fascinating, the reason why I include stuff like this in the, um, the idea of new media is because specifically magazine culture, the way that we're familiar with it today, did not start until after World War II. Uh, before then, magazine culture was like, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, the, the Pencil of Nature, Joey, who wrote that? Uh, it was uh, just 1847, and it was all about possibilities of photography. Um, um, something, he had four names, something, something, something like Tippett or something like that. But uh, that was what a typical magazine was where uh, he would send out, you had a subscription every month, you would get a different chapter of the book. And then after the magazine had run the course for that story, you could get it bound. And that's pretty, or newspaper, you know, very simple uh, neighborhood newspaper kind of thing. And it wasn't until the 50s where people started realizing that magazines could be significant advertising venues. And so you get a completely different way of, of viewing uh, publications where magazines were not paid for by subscribers. You know, you, you did generate income from that, but magazines made their money off of selling advertising space. You know, and that, that's where we get uh, the, the graphic imagery that now we associate with the glamour industry, for example, you know, architectural digest, stuff like that. That all comes from that. And Jenny Holzer is specifically latching onto that aspect of printing, which is a very 20th century phenomenon and uh, exploring that as a medium for art, which I, I think is just astounding. Now that was kind of a, a whirlwind. We were talking about uh, electronic media, video, media and then uh, print media as very, you know, more contemporary stuff. What do you guys think about those as artwork? Because I, the question that I'm asking at the end, I have a couple questions, you know, what do you think? And then what makes it so these could only happen at this particular time under these particular circumstances? And what things about these media are valid? And what things about these media are hokey <laughs> and baloney? Because there is a certain amount of that. You, you look at what Andy Warhol was doing and all the pop artists. Yeah, we, we think it's amazing now, but there is a certain amount of uh, clownish performance to it. <laughs> you know, just uh, one of the, the subtexts to Andy Warhol was his wigs. He loved wearing his wigs and very few people know about that, but he wore the wigs as kind of a manifestation of his connection to that the false perspective of market economy, and I, which I, I think is fantastic. Or 
he would also uh, go into his home or the, the, the Andy Warhol warehouse and he'd have jewelry everywhere, just gobs of jewelry. And people just assumed it was costume jewelry, but it wasn't. It was stuff from um, family collections in Europe, pieces that are worth thousands and thousands of dollars, actual genuine pearl uh, necklaces. And it would just, he just had gobs of it covering a table. And you know, he'd go back and you'd sit down and just grab handfuls of it and dump it off the chair. <laughs> you know, again, uh, kind of a substance to his whole awareness of the upside down trading of values, you know, of, uh, going from uh, things of real worth to what you're being told is of worth in, in this kind of mass market economy, which, which I, I think is really interesting. So what do, you, what do you guys think about new media and land art in general? What validates it? And what do you think is baloney? You don't have to answer all that at the same time. If you want to pick one thing to touch on, that is totally fine. Uh, I mean, I just think, um, again, like we as humans, um, we're, we're walking around, um, you, you know, we're sleepwalking most of our lives. We spend most of our lives not aware of where, you know, we're detached from the natural world. Um, and we forget that we, you know, have this like one precious life to live and to experience. And we spend most of our waking hours working and worrying about paying bills, you know. And so I, I think um, I think that it's the job of an artist to, um, to sort of try to wake people up in any way that you can. Um, you know, and, and that's the, the the funny piece about it is that you you. Um, um, I, I read the quote today somewhere. I can't remember even remember who said it, but you can't. Oh, it was Noam Chomsky. You can't pour truth into somebody's head. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and so you know, again, like there's the um, the the Buddhist uh, sutta where Buddha points his finger at the moon and says, "That's the moon," and then everybody looks at his hand and says, "Oh, that's the moon." <laughs> And I think that's what the artists are doing. They're all just pointing towards something, their way of pointing. Yudai Nyogai was the first woman Zen master in Japan. And she said, she was asked at one point, when did enlightenment come? And she said she was carrying a bucket of water that was reflecting the full moon. And it slipped out of her hands, the puddle reflected the moon on the ground and then it soaked into the ground and the moon disappeared. And then she looked up and saw it again. And I thought that that's really kind of a, a beautiful story, but it, it, it ties in directly with what you're saying. And uh, Wassily Kandinsky said, it, the job of an artist is to do exactly that. You know, and, and uh, the, another quote that came to me, Bob Proctor said, uh, most people would rather die than think. <laughs> that's which is, it's terrifying but it's true and i and i it's fascinating to me there is this huge volume of totally worthless crap that so-called artists have produced over the years but there is the there are these really beautiful things every once in a while that don't fit with the standard model of what art should be and just and if you take a moment to to be with it for a bit you start realizing what the person's saying or what it, the person is allowing you to say with the artwork there. And I think that's, that's really cool. Yeah, every once in a while you wander through a gallery and then you run into a massive garbage pail kid sculpture. Yeah, yeah. You know, and takes you right back to being 10. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> well, I, I, that, was one, <laughs> that was one thing I really loved about this year's exhibit is every year they get better. But what, what I really love is you get everything from very traditional medieval era style stuff all the way to very self-reflective uh, material that is that could not exist at any other point in time, like the garbage pail kids. <laughs> but I, and, and, I, and I love that. I love that diversity where you can walk in, you feel the entire environment is, you know, artsy stuff. But it is also artsy stuff in 
pretty much every conceivable visual language. And I, that, really, that, that's really fascinating to me. Really loved your piece too, Andrew. Oh, thank you. Very cool. I was not saying anything as a plug for, you know, uh, to receive compliments, but thank you very much. <laughs> it was I, really nice. It was fun to see because I've seen the progression in your office. Oh, of the, of the, the, those, the paintings. Yeah, that was kind of fun. There was a lady that came by the office yesterday that was really irritated with me that I took it down. <laughs> oh, well, too bad. So Brittany, what do you think about this land art and, and new media stuff? Is it nonsense? I, like I, I really like land art. I like the fleeting um, of it. You know, people, I like the fact that with art, people read into it what they want. And, and like to Joey's point, you'll come across something that will touch you in some way and somebody else the other way. And um, I don't know, I think we as humans have a special connection to nature. And when you can create art that can touch people alongside with nature, it's just more impactful. I, I, I think that there is a lot to that very much. And, and I, I say something that I, I feel pretty confident in asserting. And it's interesting to me because the more, oh, how can I say this? The more experience behind the, the audience, the more they have a tendency not to argue with me about it, which I, I think is interesting. The idea that um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder is a, a manufactured product of the 19th century. You know, it, it is, it is not a, a true idea. I, I don't think it is. It was first printed in 1812 with somebody uh, in an article where they were actually talking, an essay where they were talking about the developing consumer economy. And what, what's interesting, you know, you have somebody say, well, Shakespeare said the same thing. What he said was, it doesn't matter what you call a rose, it's still gonna smell magnificent. It's still gonna smell amazing. So he's, he's not saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. He's saying that your capacity to appreciate something changes with your life experience and your perspective. You know, I, and I think that that's the only reason why you can look at the sun tunnels when you're eight and you think, what a waste of time. This really sucks. I have to go to the bathroom. And then 20 years later, you go to it and you start crying because it's incredible. Or you see the spiral jetty, same kind of thing. We drove four hours for this. And then, you know, eight years later, you think, wow, that's astounding. It's not because the nature of thing has changed, but our capacity to appreciate it has. That, and that's one of the reasons why I like these artists so much, I think. Because you look at uh, what Jean-Claude and Christo did is force that change in perspective on people. You know, at first, they're, they're, they wonder what, why he covered it. And then they start exploring it and they're engaged and they become emotionally charged with appreciating the environment. Or you get Namjoon Pike where you, you look at it, it's entertaining. And then you start thinking, well, wait a sec, that is really true. Holy cow, I never thought of that before. You know, and he's, he's kind of forcing this, this perspective where the, the thing itself has not changed, but your capacity and your ability to articulate the beauty that's already there has increased. And I, I, I think that's what's so fascinating to me. What would Van Gogh be able to do with neon tubes? You know, what would Da Vinci be able to do with NFTs? <laughs> you know, just that, that just, the first thing I'm thinking is he'd probably have a lab of like 200, 300 people coming up with ideas constantly and then putting stuff out all the time. You know, I, I just think it would be astounding to see, but that's, so th this kind of stuff is exciting to me because it really opens the door for today. You know, what we all of us do work with traditional materials, but we're also working with materials with an awareness of the substrate technology of technology that our parents never even dreamed of when they were our age. You know, and I, I think that's astounding. Yes, Brittany. 
Well, and you know, like the fact that we have AI that can generate ideas, um, there's endless possibilities. Literally endless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's astounding to me. Well, I wanted to, and I, we're already done, but I wanted to spend just a couple minutes. And this is not for you guys because you have per, you're absolutely perfect as students. Thank you so much. It is for everybody else. That is um, quickest ways to increase scores, what I'm doing with grading and what's going on there. With the grading, I am edging in on getting done. You, you probably notice that, that numbers are changing as I, as I grade things. Uh, I'm trying to get that done as rapidly as possible. I told everybody that Sunday at midnight was the drop dead deadline. If you guys want to resubmit anything, do that up until Canvas stops working. And um, if, if you're afraid of Canvas not working, uh, resubmit stuff via email. And you know, I'll go in and, and increase the grade. And this is most often the, the things that are going on are basically um, word count and citations. You know, where, where people don't have a good word count or else the citations aren't alphabetical or they don't have the access to on or they don't follow MI format. <laughs> hey, I'm not pointing any fingers, but Joey, but, um, <laughs> and those are usually really easy things to fix. And then if, uh, I, I believe that everybody has connected with me via email regarding their um, final project idea. You get those 25 points for posting that email exchange. If you didn't make that, to talk to me in person or whatever, you know, catch me or email me right away. Uh, there has been some issues through Canvas. Email me with uh, the uh, university email, which is andrew.cosrock at utahtech.edu. And, um, or if you talk to me in person, like somebody accosted me in the parking lot today as I was trying to go home. Not really, I'm just joking around. But uh, then in that case, you can write down, hey, I talked to you about my idea on Thursday, the 28th or whatever it was. And you said, okay, go for it, but make these changes. You know, that, that kind of a thing. And, and that counts too. What that is, is just so that, um, Excuse me, it's it's uh, verified that we talked about it and I said, go ahead, basically. The reason why that's important is ages ago, I was in a philosophy class, honors philosophy class at BYU in the Mazer building, no pressure whatsoever. And I waited until last minute to turn in the final semester project. I did it completely wrong, but the guy gave me 80% anyway because he really enjoyed what I had done but I hadn't met any of the assignment parameters. And, um, but there was no time for me to redo it. So I wanna make sure that everybody uh, understand. And you know, the biggest thing has been doing something from the 19th century, doing something in contemporary art, not doing 20th century work. And as long as you tie it specifically into the 20th century and we've talked about it, then it's good. So just, just make sure for those 25 points, just make sure that it's a documentation of our conversation back and forth. So that, that's what that is. And then, like I said, get, um, I think I may have mentioned also that one of the biggest problems that people have is that they don't turn stuff in and there's nothing I can do about it. So go through and see you know, where the zeros are and turn everything in. The simplest is like the five point ones to turn, get all those turned in for attendance and everything else. But uh, get the work that you've done turned in, get the work that's almost done turned in. It's better to get 80% points than 0% points. And um, again, whatever you turn in and submit, if I turn back and say, hey, need to change these, these couple of things, change it and return it in uh, before the end of next week. And then and we'll be good. All right, does that make sense to both of you guys? Okay, excellent. Very good. Do we have a final in this class? Yes, we do. And that, that is the last thing I wanted to talk about. So perfect timing. I, I did not plan that beforehand. The final for this class, I will be emailing out, or not emailing, I'll be opening up the assignment in um, Canvas on uh, Sunday at midnight. 
and then you'll have all five days of, of finals to submit it. The final is basically four questions to be answered and then turned in. Each question needs to be answered with um, a certain number of words. And the questions are not anything to do with uh, horrible specifics. You know, what, what color of neon light was uh, Saul DeWitt's favorite? You know, things like that we're not doing. It is all about your interaction with the material. What did you learn? And what did you appreciate? That kind of a thing. And uh, so I will release those. If Canvas is closed, yeah, and Utah Tech has been really good about letting us do that. Um, if Canvas is closed for whatever reason, then I will use email and email everybody. So do check your email, do check Canvas, make sure that you have access to that. And let me know if uh, that is not working if, you know, for any reason. It is absolutely vital that everybody participates and everybody does that. If people don't, uh, you could lose up to a full letter grade. So um, it is, this is for everybody watching this video in the class, make sure that you take that final assignment. All right, so that, that is our class final. And Brittany, I'm gonna see you in person too in one of the classes. So you'll experience the final twice, which is just, you are so blessed. <laughs> Any last observations today about the material we covered? I, I was thinking when you were talking about, you know, Christo and Jean-Claude, how cool it was that when they did that video and in their apartment, you could see works from all other kind of people, you know? It, I think it's important for artists to look at other artists and kind of collaborate or bounce ideas off of, or, you know, push uh, something further than what you've seen before. It's just kind of fascinating. Well, yeah, and it's, it's interesting to me because each of those people that we looked at, they talked about their collaborations. You know, they, they, and it wasn't usually formal collaborations. It was, they were influenced by the people around them. And I, I think what was fascinating about Jean-Claude and Christo is that they weren't specifically targeting their, their collection. It was evidence of their friendships evidence of their connections. And I, I love that because you may not be able to trace exactly how uh, Andy Warhol influenced their work on the Reichstag, but they're addressing the same kind of cultural and social landscapes that he did. It was definitely was an impact there. You know, and they, they kind of flow, flowed into each other. And I, I think that that kind of stuff is fascinating, very much so. And I loved, I also loved seeing evidence of Crystal and Jean-Claude's process in their living space. And the fact that they and just a bunch of other hippies built the whole space themselves. I, I think that's awesome. I, I love that. And they were, they were together longer than some countries have lasted <laughs> as a couple. I, I think that's fantastic. And it was a complete collaborative togetherness too. You know, they, they didn't lose their identities with each other. Both of them became a lot more working closely with the other. And I, I think that's fantastic. Excellent. How about you, Joey? Any last thoughts? Mm, man, that just stirred up a lot too. Um, uh, so yeah, their, their home, it was interesting. You know, you see like a, a, a hand scribbled, you know, Keith Haring on a piece of yeah, galvanized yeah. tin and, you know, next to trash. Yeah. Uh, you know, evidence of, um, you know, I like how you said evidence of their friendships, but to me, it's also just, it's just the residue of, of, of a life well lived, uh, you know, with purpose. Um, and it reminded me of, um, of the Barnes collection. Um, and if you're not familiar anyway, um, what I like about it is, uh, those walls end up becoming, um, you know, it's not just a Keith Haring now. Keith Haring's part of now a symphony that they've orchestrated with all this right. other stuff. And it's something so much different than just that little piece was, you know, where you see a lot of those those little tiny things get sequestered to its own little space in a gallery. Right. I loved seeing the hodgepodge of all of it. And just, you know, every square, every available inch on some of those walls was covered with something. It's cool. Yeah, it's like the artwork was provided a space to live in. 
instead of a, a, span, a sanitized enclosure to survive it. Yeah, it's part it's, of a collection too. Yeah, yeah, that, that's excellent observation. I love that. All right, folks, I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful time. Uh, I know that everyone looks forward to finals the entire semester, and I hope you are doing that the same. The final for this class, I do not want people to stress. There's absolutely no reason to stress. My primary responsibility is not to be a jerk and uh, score points with the academic master gods. My primary responsibility is to make sure that you guys have the best possible chance to succeed. So um, I, I, there is some flexibility that I'm afforded. If, you, if anybody's have, struggling, having any issues, talk to my friend Baco over at the accommodations office, which is right to the right of the testing center. And uh, let me know what's going on, you know, very much. There's no reason that people should stress out of their gourds about something as silly as art. <laughs> you know, so uh, please let me know if there's, if there's any issues. And, you know, human beings, we're human beings living in a very malleable world. So things happen all the time. Just let me know. All right. All right, guys. I hope you have a wonderful week, wonderful weekend. And I look forward to seeing you in the hallways. Thank you. Thanks. See ya. All right. We'll see ya.